and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we it's great to see a full house today here in Japan. Uh, as all, many of you know, Japan is one of my favorite places to come, uh, and I'm really happy to be here this week. You know, I want to start by re-emphasizing uh, how important open source is. Apparently, in Japan, 30% of you don't think open source is important, although 70% of you do. Uh, so I hope to convince the remaining 30% about how important open source is. If you think about it, over the last 30 years, almost every major technology change, starting with the internet, has been built using open source software. And I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at uh, this different technology and how these technology shifts happen and what was the open source component that made it happen. I mean, the internet was built on open source, like every component from web servers to the underlying operating system uh, really was enabled, particularly in the early days by open source software. But today, uh, to this day, really the internet runs on open source. In mobile, Android as an open source platform really enabled uh, the mobile devices to flourish. Uh, in applications, uh, Node.js, you know, JavaScript really is a fundamental building block of building mobile apps. Uh, in the API era, things like OpenAPI, our Kamara project, GraphQL are powering that. In software-defined networking, the Linux Foundation uh, is home to our Linux Foundation networking project. Uh, and if you think about all of the different SDN components, most of them today are, are open source. Cloud computing obviously was built using cloud native technology, the entirety of which is really open source building blocks that are used to run Amazon, Google Cloud, uh, Azure, and many, many more. Uh, in, today, in some of the newer trends in uh, technology, particularly in AI, we're seeing the same thing. Open source, things like PyTorch, uh, and, and other uh, open source components are really fueling uh, the advances that we see in large language models. And so at the Linux Foundation, we thought, let's try and figure out what the dollar value, in addition to the innovation value uh, of open source really is. And when we look at it, in order to rebuild, to rewrite critical open source software, it would take billions of dollars worth of development but more importantly, on the demand side value, if all of your companies and all of our governments had to go purchase all of those open source building blocks that you just saw that were used in every major tech transition, it would cost $9 trillion to go do so. I mean, it's just a phenomenal value that is created every single day in open source. Really, in 2024, any major technology product or service that you can think of uses open source for fundamental building blocks in order to go to market. And today, if you go look on GitHub, there are millions of open source projects. And we thought, OK, there are millions of open source projects, but we only have thousands of open source components at the Linux Foundation. So what's the difference? And I think the easy way to think about it, and the reason you're all here this week, is that the Linux Foundation's projects, the projects that you're all here to talk about today, represent the most important open source building blocks. If we go back, you can see here, I've highlighted all of the different Linux Foundation projects that are been being used in these major technology shifts. And that's really the key. At the Linux Foundation, we're home to critical open source projects, projects that all of society depends upon every day. You know, Linux itself, the Linux kernel, is inside 90% of the world's computers. And it's important to have a home for those projects. And it's important to have an organization that helps make sure that that code is more secure. Hope to, helps to make sure that the intellectual property for that software is well maintained. And that's really what the Linux Foundation does. And at the Linux Foundation, we're not just about open source, we're also about open hardware, open data, open standards, and more. 
Today we have representatives from a variety of different open collaboration projects here. Uh, Mark is here today from our Overture Maps Foundation. Uh, this is the world's largest free geospatial data set that's being used to create mapping experiences, augmented reality experiences. Uh, today you'll hear from Matt White from the PyTorch Foundation, which is uh, one of the critical components to create large language models. Today there's representatives here from RISC-V, another project in the Linux Foundation family uh, that is the home to the world's fastest growing open semiconductor instruction set. You'll hear today about our SPDX standard, which is used to create software bill of materials inventory in order to track open source components and make open source supply chain more secure. We think it's not just about open code, it's about a whole variety of open ecosystems that are important to modern innovation. So today I wanna to talk about some of the hot trends that we're seeing here at the Linux Foundation and that you can hopefully all discuss this week and hear more about at the various sessions uh, throughout the day. Today some of the most important topics that I'm seeing involve central bank digital currency and the future of money, things like the digital yen. Navigating open source challenges in a changing geopolitical landscape. There are new uh, conversations happening about artificial intelligence and large language model and what it really means to be open in a world of artificial intelligence. I'm gonna talk a little bit about security and trust and then introduce some new research studies like the one you just saw about the open source community in Japan. I thought I'd first start talking about one of the things that we're seeing more and more traction with at the foundation and that is central bank digital currency. You know, central bank digital currency is what is uh, be used to create a digital version of the yen or the US dollar or the Indian rupee. And these are built using blockchain technology that till today you really mainly saw in cryptocurrencies, things like Ethereum and Bitcoin. But around the world, slowly, regulators are understanding how useful digital currency can be and how having digital currency that's regulated by governments can really get you all of the convenience that you want using cryptocurrency, but the oversight and trust that you count on from monetary policymakers in government. And because open source is such an effective way to collectively develop, to transparently explain how these digital currencies are created, we're seeing a huge amount of traction from our Hyperledger project being used in central bank digital currency efforts around the world. It's a cost-effective way and a trustworthy way to build central bank digital currency. And today we're seeing it in a whole variety of efforts in the European Union, in France, here in Japan, Norway, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Philippines. I was just in India uh, two weeks ago where they're making rapid progress in using trials around the digital rupee uh, to create central bank digital currency and using uh, our Hyperledger projects technologies to do so. So if you're here from a central bank or from the financial services industry, central bank digital currency is a topic that you can expect to see a lot more about in the coming weeks and in years. One of the other things that's a hot topic at the Linux Foundation is that in 2024, we live in a much more complicated world. Today, we're seeing challenges all over the world with new regulations around privacy, around cybersecurity. In the European Union, they just passed the Cyber Resiliency Act, which has implications for open source. In the United States, the uh, Biden administration uh, passed executive orders or issued executive orders uh, with new rules uh, for the software supply chain and its security that impact uh, open source. Um, we're seeing a whole bunch of these things, including new friction in the open source ecosystem coming from regulators and coming uh, from 
uh, policies around export administration regulations uh, and sanctions uh, that have recently been in the news. How many here recently saw some of the news around the Linux kernel project and some controversy around uh, some uh, Russian developers uh, who were excluded from the project? How many of you saw that? So quite a few of you. And you know, I got a lot of questions about this uh, when it happened, and I wanna kind of address some of these issues. What I wanna start uh, off with is yes, this did happen. And what I wanna emphasize is the reason that this happened is not because the Linux Foundation or the Linux kernel community wants to shut people out of the development process. As a fundamental principle of open source, we believe in individuals. That's our number one priority. Individuals who get together in an organic way to participate in open source is a core value that makes it such a important and effective way to build software. However, one of the new realities in 2024, because open source is so important, because open source is such an important building block, open source is also now subject to the laws and regulations all around the world. And let's face it, unlike a lot of the individuals in our community, sometimes governments around the world don't get along. And they pass rules and they pass sanctions that all of us have to comply with, either where we live or where our counterparties live who are participating in open source. And so that's why this took place in the Linux kernel project, because we have to understand who is working in the kernel on behalf of what organization, and if that organization is subject to sanctions compliance, we need to follow the law in the jurisdictions that have those sanctions, like the European Union, like here in Japan, like in the USA, because following rules, following the law is not optional for our communities. Now I think it's challenging, right? Because people kind of react immediately saying, oh no, are we gonna ban developers? And the answer is no, we're only following the rules around sanctions that prevent us from working with developers who work with companies, work on behalf of companies that are on sanctions lists in the jurisdictions that we have. And so it's important for us to understand who is working for what organization. And sometimes developers, particularly in Linux, which is over 30 years old, forget to update who they're working for. So I actually anticipate some of the developers who were removed from the kernel development process will be added back in if they can demonstrate that they're working for an organization that's not subject to these rules, uh, and then they'll be able to rejoin the community. At the Linux Foundation, we want to lead here by making sure that we communicate that we want to promote an open exchange of ideas and build tools that make it easier for individuals to understand who is able to participate and not. Uh, we're also going to be publishing in the coming weeks a white paper that will explain how these rules work around the world so that it's much easier for developers and open source projects to comply with these new rules. So stay tuned. Uh, what I wanna say is I don't think that this will cause a major change in how open source is developed. It is simply something that is required by law in various places around the world, including here in Japan. And the Linux Foundation is gonna make it as easy as possible and as transparent as possible for everybody in open source communities to follow those regulations. So now, it's not just about following regulations. Another hot topic is trying to understand artificial intelligence and what it means to be open source as it relates to AI. You know, the, the, the question I always get asked is, what is 
OpenAI. And not OpenAI, the company, the home to ChatGPT, but Open Space AI, the idea of OpenAI that is a AI technology that anybody can use to create uh, artificial intelligence applications. What is the idea of open source AI? And this has been surprisingly difficult to answer over the last year or so. And I think the reason for that is because um, a lot of us here have been working in open source for a long time. How many people here have worked in open source for more than 10 years? So quite a lot of you. So when everyone was first asked about open source AI, of course, we immediately thought, OK, let's look at the open source definition that's housed by OSI. And the open source definition really centers around copyright licenses. Open source is really defined by a set of licenses housed at uh, open, the open source initiative that are copyright licenses, ways to license software, the Apache license, the GPL license, the MIT license, uh, that are uh, seen as open source. And the problem with just using a copyright license regime to define open source is that the set of components that you need to create large language models like Llama 3 or ChatGPT or so forth, GPT-4, uh, are, are far broader than just uh, the code itself. It involves data, it involves access to weights, it involves uh, the instructions about how those models were created. And so one of the things that I found really interesting lately was an article by Stephen O'Grady, uh, an analyst at Red Monk uh, that is an expert in open source, asking a really simple question. Maybe we're using the wrong way to look at what open AI is if we just try and use license definitions, sort of the traditional open source definition to do that. And I think that we do need, I think Stephen makes a really good point. We do need to think differently about open AI, moving beyond sort of the traditional definitions of open source and looking at a more nuanced way to describe open AI that involves different levels of openness, different components of openness so that people can understand when they're using one level of openness, maybe accessing something like Llama 3, that that might be different than a pure open source uh, scientific data model that has every component open uh, in the traditional sense and really have an easier, more accurate way to describe openness uh, through that effort. And so to do that, what we did at the Linux Foundation in our LFAI and Big Data project was created a model openness framework that would uh, help create standard definitions in a few clear areas with common terms that enabled collaboration uh, and that infor helped inform regulators with a consistent and standard way to do that. And so what we think about in terms of open AI is what level of openness are all of the different components that are used to create these AI models? The weights, the architecture, the data used to train that model. Is uh, there any licenses for restricted use, modification, and distribution, and so forth? And so while you build AI models with open source software, you also are using other components that may or may not be completely open. And so what we found was two main categories of openness when it comes to AI. The first is the open science AI models. We just released an updated white paper on this week. You can go to the LFAI and Big Data website and see this. And in an open science AI model, what we define that by is how all of the components that are used to uh, build that model are really open source. The source code, the training data, all of the research, all of the things that are needed for full reproducibility of that model. 
And we see a lot of projects that are very helpful, particularly in academia, particularly to just, you know, help understand safety and trust issues in AI, that this can truly, truly help. It creates scientific rigor and full transparency. However, when we looked at this, and we love the open science AI definition, we found that there was a second category of openness that we needed to acknowledge. And uh, what that uh, definition is, is one where the data might not be open, but descriptions of the data might be open, things like Llama 3. We're seeing an incredible amount of innovation happen coming from open data models that may not be uh, in the open scientific way purely open, but are really providing a lot of utility to AI practitioners. And so the Linux Foundation and our LFAI Big Data Initiative are harmonizing our definitions of this. I really encourage you to go on to the LFAI and Big Data website and look at uh, our three-tier model of describing uh, open uh, AI. So moving on from AI, another big uh, topic that we hear about all the time that is changing in uh, open source is things around open source security. And the Linux Foundation is doing a lot of work in open source security. How many people here are working in our Open Source Security Foundation here this week? Quite a few of you. So we have meetings here in Japan this week for our Open Source Security Foundation. We're working with the Japanese government here uh, and industry to help improve open source security, provide better testing, uh, provide better education for secure coding practices for open source projects, helping improve open source projects that are critical to us all by getting developers to be able to work on them uh, in order to improve their security. We've rolled out new package signing software for the major package repositories in order to make sure that there's secure distribution of open source software through our SIGStore project and more. And so what we see is a lot of time, energy, investment going into helping make open source more secure. However, one of the things that I've been looking at this year is that security is not enough. What really we need to do is one extra thing in order to create a more secure ecosystem. And what I mean by that is we need better tools to establish trust amongst developers. You know, a lot of times people confuse security from a traditional cybersecurity perspective and trust. And today what I want to explain to you is how important both security and trust are in open source communities and how they're slightly different. I think security is pretty easy to understand. You know, it's all of the things I just talked about. But trust is one of the more difficult things for us all to tr uh, tackle in a community made up of hundreds of thousands of open source developers. How many people here are familiar with the XZ attack that happened earlier this year? So many, most of you are familiar with this. So XZ Utils is a compression library used in Linux. And uh, a couple of years ago, an identity, Gia Tan, started working in the XZ Utils project. Uh, and over time, kind of built up a reputation in that project. Uh, and eventually, Jia Tan got access to the commit bit, became a maintainer of XCUtils, and then put a back door into the project because that person was able to commit code uh, without anybody knowing it until many eyes made all bug shallow and we kind of got a little bit lucky. A developer at Microsoft saw some unusual CPU activity in uh, the project and found the back door before it had gone out into a uh, major release, into uh, Linux distributions that would have resulted in a major back door to millions of systems uh, around the world. The issue here is not that security didn't work, 
we found the bug, right? Someone was able to, you know, through some testing, find the bug. What failed here was that Gia Tan, this identity that no one had ever met, nobody knew who Gia Tan worked for, got commit access to the project, became a maintainer for the project. And this is something that I really want to encourage communities to start thinking about. Because it's not just in XZ. The Linux Foundation also found and eliminated similar activity in JavaScript projects uh, in our OpenJS community. So this is something that we definitely see as a attack vector that can harm open source communities by using our trust, or should I say abusing our trust, in order to create security vulnerabilities. The easiest way to think about how we can attack this problem is to think about three questions that are important to open source security. What is the world's most critical software? What's the most important software, right? Turns out we went and asked a whole bunch of enterprises what software they're using, and there's about 15,000 software components that are commonly used, open source components, that are commonly used across most enterprises. These are the world's most critical open source components. And you can sort of stack rank these based on criticality, sort of Linux being at the top, and you know, things that involve cryptography, OpenSSL, OpenSSH, and so forth, all the way down to you know, NPM packages that are very commonly used. The second question you want to ask is, OK, we know which software is important. Who writes that software, right? Who can fix that software if we find security problems? And then the third question is, is it secure? Is it something that we all want to use? It's the second question that I think is very difficult for the open source community to address. I think we've already got a good idea of what the most important software is. I think we already have a good way to understand security vulnerabilities that come from bugs, uh, how to uh, distribute software in a more secure way, and so forth. It's the who can I trust question that's difficult. And this is something that our uh, organization, the Linux Foundation, uh, and our Trust over IP organization, which is part of Linux Foundation Decentralized Trust, is thinking about and working on. How can we create better decentralized trust systems that make it easier for developers to understand who is working for whom within an open source community? And allow a set of tools that allow whether it's the Linux kernel community or the JavaScript community, to create their own policies about what kind of reputation system they want to use to establish trust in order to give people a maintainer role. Maybe that rule is they need to uh, have come to a conference once. Uh, if Gia Tan had come to a conference, people would have known who it was, and it would have been harder for a fake identity to be used. Or maybe you need to have a confirmed employer. You need to know who someone works for. If you, it's much harder to fake an employment relationship than to just use a fake identity on the internet, as we all know. But the Linux Foundation right now is working early on in trying to create a policy-based way to establish decentralized trust so that all open source communities can create rules in which they can improve the way they establish trust amongst each other in their communities. I think this is going to be an important topic over the coming years. Finally, I want to quick highlight some new research before I introduce Matt White uh, from our PyTorch project to talk about uh, some trends going on there in AI. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, our LF research organization uh, just released a new study on software bill of materials. Uh, our SPDX project continues to grow. Uh, this report compares the AI bill of materials with SPDX and other SBOM standards and illustrates where the gaps are and how we might improve them. Next, we have a new report uh, sponsored by Intel asking about uh, open source developers. Uh, in this report, we asked open source communities what do developers need to improve their uh, careers. 
And then by vast majority of those folks talked about the different kind of skills that they need to be effective in developer communities. Uh, it's worth a read uh, if you're an open source developer. Here are just a couple of the highlights uh, from that report. Uh, unsurprisingly, coming to events like this was one of the most important things open source developers said uh, they need. Finally, uh, Nori highlighted our uh, Japan uh, research uh, earlier today. Uh, this was a really interesting report looking at how Japanese uh, folks, people from this country, are participating in open source. And what we saw is a lot of enthusiasm about open source, but a little bit of a gap uh, in how open source developers here in Japan are actually contributing. And so you can see here that only 20% of Japanese organizations contribute to open source compared with uh, 45, uh, 42% uh, globally. And we'd like to see the number of Japanese uh, on par with other global organizations. And we're here in Japan this week to help close uh, that gap. Sorry for the English uh, speakers in the uh, crowd. So with that, uh, I would like to introduce Matt White, who's the head of our PyTorch organization, to give us an update on open source and AI. Come on up, Matt.